Thank you for having me here. Thanks, Julie. Good to be here at last. Right, so uh, I want to start on that word, indications, Psychi psychiatric indications. There are no psychiatric indications. Here's where the problem lies at the very beginning of this kind of a debate. Psychiatric diagnosis is flawed. Psychiatric diagnosis comes from psychiatric epidemiology, which is flawed. It always has been. In more recent years, it's flawed because the pharmaceutical industry like diagnoses, because diagnoses means products to treat symptoms. And research needs diagnoses as well, because you can't just say, I want to look at someone's well-being. You've got to target something. You've got to choose something. You've got to choose depression, anxiety, eating disorders, PTSD, personality disorders, addictions. But we know that these are flawed because we know that all long-term chronic anxiety-based disorders are based in trauma. So I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist by training, so forgive me, everything for me comes back to the attachment relationship and to trauma. Um, now, if you mistreat a child, if you hurt or humiliate a child, in any way whatsoever, either big T trauma, physical or sexual abuse, small T trauma, emotional abuse, neglect, and damage that child and damage that attachment relationship, you're going to have on your hands a damaged adult. This is the strongest effect size in all of psychiatry, this link between attachment disorder and adult mental disorder. Now, it doesn't matter what diagnosis that person's going to get. They're going to get something. And I think of these different individual psychiatric diagnoses as fruiting bodies of a mushroom. Now, you may get an, an eating disorder, you may get uh, PTSD, you may get an addiction, you may get a personality disorder, you might get depression, you might get anxiety. It doesn't matter, they are all red herrings. What's really important is the mycelium below the ground, and that's the trauma. And when we queue up with these pharmaceutical products that are aimed at each individual disorder, we are not seeing the wood for the trees. We're treating the symptoms, and these symptoms all overlap. And people with post-traumatic stress disorder, they present with depression and anxiety and poor sleep. And so they're on antidepressants, hypnotics, mood stabilizers, antipsychotics, sedatives, all of these different classes of drugs, none of which treat the mycelium below. They paper over the cracks symptomatically. So we've got to first of all realize that this, even this entire subject psychiatric indications is flawed. And one of the things about psychedelics is they're helping us to redraw the boundaries of what this means to treat people with mental disorder. I believe in 15 or 20 years' time, we won't have the word psychiatry anymore. We'll have neuropsychiatry, where things like ADHD and epilepsy and head injuries lie. Um, and neurology will mold into that as well. And then we'll have a big amorphous thing called trauma-based illness, in which all of these other things swim together without the symptomatic labels. So there's the destruction of psychiatry for you, first of all. Um, now let's destroy psychedelics. Now, um, the taxonomy of psychedelics is a very thorny subject on its own. And the purists will say psychedelics, with a big capital P, are the classic psychedelics. Uh, sometimes we call these the serotonergic psychedelics or the tryptamine psychedelics, MDM, uh, uh, LSD, DMT, 5-MeO, DMT, mescaline, psilocybin. And, and the purists will say you can't, you can't call MDMA a psychedelic, you can't call ketamine a psychedelic. Well, I would argue you can. If we define psychedelics as compounds that induce an altered state of consciousness in a clinical setting, allow a patient to address uh, repressed emotional feelings and break this cycle of rigidity that's come from this, this disordered attachment relationship, then we have a whole load of other things that fit into psychedelic. MDMA is certainly psychedelic. It's an intactogen, but it's psychedelic. I've seen psychedelic experiences on MDMA. Um, THC, even cannabis, try taking pure IV THC with no CBD. Tell me that's not psychedelic, it is. Ibogaine, salvia, ketamine, dissociative anesthetics, tell me ketamine is not a psychedelic experience. They damn well are. So the psychedelics have a broad definition, and it's not just the classics. Now, in answering the question about why they work across multiple indications, we also have a broad range of different neurobiological approaches. So the, the classic psychedelics via the default mode network, dampening that rumination aspect of the default mode network down. That's one, one, one part of neurobiology. MDMA, turning off the amygdala, allowing you to address and recall painful traumatic memories you no, normally avoid. That's another kind of mode of action. 
Ketamine with dendritic spikes. You can actually see the dendritic spikes, spikes growing in a Petri dish on tissue soaked in ketamine, causing this neuroplasticity, which allows for freedom of thought and greater options, which translates psychologically into new ways of thinking. There's three different medicines, ketamine, psilocybin, MDMA all with different modes of action, but they all come to the same place. I'm not a neuroscientist. I don't care how these things work. My patients don't care how they work. What they do, do in common, they come to the same place. They open the window of opportunity for focused psychotherapy. And so it doesn't really matter how they're all working and they all have different models. Um, I am a trained MDMA, ketamine, and psilocybin psychotherapist. And in my experience, the similarities between MDMA, ketamine, and psilocybin are much greater than their differences, especially so in a clinical setting. When we're giving these drugs in a clinical setting with preparation sessions, guided drug sessions with eye shades and headphones and music and uh, a, a therapist holding your hand, and then next day integration sessions that are, so we've got a psychotherapy course with a number of drug sessions and non-drug sessions. Now, I'm not so naive as to suggest that the psychological experience of ketamine, MDMA, and psilocybin are the same. They're all very different, but my argument would be in the clinical setting, they're much more similar than they are different. You're going in there with an intention to do some work with this therapist. The medicine acts as a lubricant. It's a primer. It's a primer that opens this window of opportunity for psychotherapy. So that's why psychedelics seem to work on all these indications. Now, what we've had over the last few years is this pigeonholing. You know, like, oh, so we hear, apparently psilocybin works for OCD. There's a study here with 15 people in it. Oh, right, MDMA works for PTSD. Oh, really, there's a study here with all these people in it. Oh, no, but those guys in Bristol found it also works for alcohol use disorder. Oh, maybe it works for alcohol use disorder. Oh, look, we've ketamine seems to work for depression. Oh, no, but they just did a study with ketamine and OCD. It works for that. Oh, and eating disorders and bulimia and personality disorders. So open your eyes here. Where are we going? The pigeonholing of recent years is an artifact of the limited number of studies that we've been doing. And if we extrapolate this 5, 10, 15 years from now, we're going to be in this position where every single psychedelic has been tried on every single psychiatric indication. Ba-ding! They all work through different mechanisms because they all are nonspecific adjuncts to psychotherapy. And that's what it's about opening that window of opportunity, hitting them with the psychotherapy when their brain is in that primed state, resulting in lasting, meaningful change, lifestyle changes, moving forward. The drugs are not going to work on their own. Psychiatry is a multimodal, multifactorial, multidimensional subject. I think American psychiatrists, you guys give the world of psychiatry a bad name. Because for you, it's all about drugs. I was always trained in the biopsychosocial model. No amount of Prozac or ayahuasca or LSD or ketamine or MDMA is going to cure that patient. If they go back to that crummy house in that crummy relationship and that racism and that in exclusion and that poverty and uh, poor housing. Psychiatry is about treating the whole person holistically. And the thing about psychedelics is they do spontaneously encourage us to do that. After taking psychedelics, you, without needing to be asked, you have this appreciation for nature. You look at the consumerism around you and you think, do I need 15 types of pasta? Surely one is enough? So you have this spontaneous change that comes from psychedelics. And they all have different modes of action. They all have different names. They all come from different plants. But they all open the window of opportunity. So Stan Groff said, that LSD is a specific, uh, non-specific adjunct to psychotherapy, I would say all of them are non-specific adjuncts to psychotherapy. And we just need to take a bit more time to do all the studies, and then we can see that. So in terms of the future, what does this mean? So what we're going to be able to do in the future, you'll be able to go into the, into the clinic, and you will sit down, and you will have this whole smorgasbord. Well, first of all, you won't have a diagnosis. You'll just have a trauma-based illness. And I don't care what it is. And when the patients sit down in front of me, I'm doing this now in my own practice, I say, I don't care. What do you call it? Bulimia? Anxiety? PTSD? I don't really care what you call it. It's, you're not well, you're not happy, and it's about connection and disconnection. And it's about your trauma, and it's about your pain, and it's about those avoidant things you've never been able to talk about. This thing, ketamine, could work. This thing, MDMA, could work. This thing, psilocybin, could work. So in the future, we're going to have that position where this whole load of options will be available. And then... It may be that over the years, certain medicines work for certain conditions in certain people, but not for everyone. 
And I don't think we should fall into this gap that psilocybin is for this, MDMA is for that. What we need to do is a patient-focused approach. Let the patient choose. Build bespoke care plans based around the patient's tolerance of that drug. So maybe we would start with um, you try them all, and then you choose the one you liked, and you carry on with that. So I'm going to finish now with a final word um, in respect and honor of this beautiful place. And this is a quote from Abraham Lincoln, who I gather was one of your presidents. And he said, <laughs> he said, it is a quality of revolutions not to go by old lines or old laws, but to break up both and make new ones. Thank you. Kevin, I told you Ben would do a good job. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sessa. That was absolutely energizing and validating. Um, I am also a huge fan of the next speaker, Dr. Dr. Gold Dolan, MD, PhD, um, who got her PhD at Brown and MIT, her MD and PhD at Brown and MIT, and she began her faculty position in the Department of Neuroscience at Johns Hopkins University. Um, building on her lab's recent discovery that psychedelics as a class reopen the social reward learning critical period, she has initiated the Fathom Project, Psychedelic Healing Adjunct Therapy Harnessing Opened Malleability. And I will let Dr. Gould Dolan tell you about the rest. Please welcome her. Thank you very much. I uh, rarely say this, but I agree with almost everything that guy said. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so I spoke at this conference last year, and so I'm going to try and just quickly, for those of you who didn't see that talk, give you a summary of what, where we've been in the last few years, and then at the end kind of give you some unpublished data that I think clarifies, for me anyway, why it is these drugs um, seem to be having such wide-ranging therapeutic and non-therapeutic effects, and hopefully even try to get at the answer of, you know, what is the similarity between the drug-induced mystical states and the non-drug-induced mystical states? So let's see. All right, so for those of you who are not neuroscientists, um, there is a concept in neuroscience that's been around since 1935, um, called critical periods, or for the aficionados, they're sometimes called sensitive periods. And these are windows of time when the brain is extremely sensitive to its environment and able to make long-lasting memories relating to that environment. So the first critical period that was ever described was um, the imprinting behavior in snow geese. So within 48 hours of hatching, if a little snow geese um, is exposed to its mother, it forms a long-lasting attachment to its mother. But if its mother isn't available for some reason, it'll make that attachment to the scientist, in this case, Conrad Lorenz, um, or a model airplane. And 48 hours later, um, if you expose them to another moving object or any other potential um, uh, object that they could form an attachment to, they won't form that attachment. And that very narrow window of time when the animals are extremely sensitive to and able to form these long-lasting memories is called a critical period. Now, since Conrad Lorenz first described that and actually won the Nobel Prize for that discovery, um, a number of other critical periods have been described. And so critical periods for most of you in this audience will be familiar if you tried to learn another language as an adult. So you know that the language that you learned as a child, you learned very easily and without much effort, and you have no accent when you speak it. Whereas if you try to learn a language later on, um, you will always have an accent, and it always takes a, a huge amount of effort. And that's because there is a critical period for language learning. Closes around five or six. Um, and then 
Um, there are other critical periods for songbird learning, organization of the somatosensory cortex in rodents has been described. Two other Nobel Prizes have been given for the critical period for um, visual, the ocular dominance plasticity uh, critical period, because that's where we've worked out most of the molecular and cellular mechanisms, which include a, a whole variety of things, not just metaplasticity, but also regulation of the extracellular matrix, inhibitory excitatory balance. I'm not going to get into it. Um, and then just sort of thinking about how we might expand the idea of critical periods. There's also critical periods for recovery from things like stroke. So after you have a stroke, you have this very short window of time where you can recover motor function when you pair um, the recovery period, that open state of the critical period, with lots of intensive psycho, uh, physical therapy, not psychotherapy in this case. And so neuroscientists have been obsessed with this idea of critical periods because we've had for a very long time the intuition that the reason that we fail so much in uh, treating patients with neuropsychiatric disease, um, that includes everything from neurology to um, trauma, um, is because by the time we get around to intervening, the relevant critical periods have closed. So people have had the intuition that we want to find sort of a master key for unlocking critical periods, and that would be a major boon for um, uh, our attempts to treat these diseases. So when I started my own lab at Hopkins about nine years ago, um, I was obsessed with the idea of trying to figure out um, if there was a critical period for social reward learning or social learning. And there are a variety of reasons for this, but I will just summarize quickly by telling you that there, we did discover a critical period for social reward learning. Like many other critical periods, it, um, it peaks around um, the juvenile period or puberty in a mouse. Um, and then as the animals mature, it closes and by adulthood, um, no longer uh, able to learn from the social environment in the same way um, that they did as juveniles. Okay, and so then the next big question we had is, could we use MDMA, which is a psychedelic um, which has this very remarkable empathogenic quality, this desire to be pro-social, to touch, to hug, to do um, these uh, cuddle puddles, these huge social gatherings, which, you know, on, without MDMA look a little hot and uncomfortable, but on, on MDMA, you know, people really want to do this, right? And so we thought, okay, of all the psychedelics, MDMA is strange, and it has this pro-social property, so if we had to guess, this is the one that would reopen the critical period for social reward learning, and it did. But then we were really, really surprised when all the other psychedelics did it too. And so for this, this, this was the first time we had the insight that maybe the acute subjective qualities that differ so much across psychedelics are sort of a red herring, and that actually the thing that unifies them, this altered state of consciousness, is what is responsible for this critical period reopening. And indeed, when we looked at ketamine, LSD, psilocybin, MDMA, and ibogaine, they all reopened our critical period for social reward learning. And this was our first hint that maybe these are the master keys that we've been looking for. One of the things that differentiates psychedelics from all these different uh, classes from each other is that while they all have this um, altered state of consciousness as a characteristic, they differ in the time course of their acute subjective effects. So ketamine is very short acting, psilocybin and MDMA are sort of intermediary, LSD a little longer, ibogaine lasts 36 to 72 hours. And what we realized when we looked at the duration of the open state of the critical period induced by these drugs, it was proportional. It wasn't the same, it was proportional. And this proportionality tells us a couple of things. One, it suggests that the mechanism for the acute subjective effects of the psychedelics and the mechanism for reopening cri critical period, our, our critical period are related. Second, it suggests that because ketamine, for example, keeps it open for 48 hours, is closed at a week, psilocybin and MDMA keep it open for two weeks, closed at three weeks, LSD, open at three weeks, closed at four weeks. Ibogaine, we actually haven't found a, an end point for when it closes. Um, <laughs> uh, is that 
this is potentially a therapeutic opportunity that we are missing because we are not focusing enough on the post-acute subjective integration phase. Um, it's also potentially something that we need to be careful about when we are thinking about uh, protecting patients once they come out of the treatment sessions. I think that putting people in this vulnerable state similar to their childhood state of susceptibility and vulnerability is something that we want to do very carefully and that we build in the appropriate safeguarding um, mechanisms to make sure that um, we're not doing harm. And I think the third thing that this suggests to me is, is that for all of the drug companies out there who are trying to develop psychedelics that are reducing the duration of the acute subjective effects, you're potentially also reducing the duration of the open state. And if the open state of this critical period or any critical period is an important part of the therapeutic properties of these drugs, then you could potentially be interfering with those therapeutic properties. Okay, so that's basically where I ended last year and I told you, okay, we're gonna try and cure stroke, we're gonna try and cure all kinds of other diseases that might have, um, that might be sort of hard to cure right now because by the time we get around to curing them, the critical period is closed. And so now to some psychology. <laughs> um, um, so I just want to take a moment here and pause and ask, why do critical periods exist? Why do they close? And why can we reopen them? So I think intuitively we understand that critical periods exist because, you know, as William James said, man is born with a tendency to do more things than he has ready-made arrangements for in his nerve centers. He said this before synapses, before genetics, before even critical periods had been described. But I think what he's getting at is, is that, you know, I'm Turkish, my parents are Turkish, but I was born here. If language was something that was genetically encoded, I would not be able to speak to you in fluent native English, right? So we, we want to have this opportunity to learn from our environment. It expands the capacity capabilities of the brain. Um, so why do they close? Well, you know, if you've ever watched a child, um, you know, Learning from your environment in this way all the time is emotionally draining. It's not very focused. You know, trying to get a kid out the door on a snow day um, is painful, you know. And I think, you know, intuitively, psych people on psychedelics, you know, it's like herding kittens, you know, it's just hard. They don't focus because they're not in that sort of habit based mode of, of functioning. And William James hated these bundles of habits. He said, could the young but realize how soon they will become mere walking bundles of habits, they would give more heed to their conduct during the plastic state. I would say that habits get a bad rap, but they're, they're important and we need them. But under what extraordinary circumstance can you imagine, oh, I'm almost out, okay. Uh, can you imagine that they might need to be reopened? Well, imagine that there's a radical shift in your environment and suddenly you have to deal with, um, you know, a pandemic or if you're a mouse, you know, a wolf ate your whole social group. Um, so these radical shifts in our environment, you could imagine that if we, if, or you move to a new country where they, all they speak is Japanese, then you might want to be able to relearn from your environment. And so neuroscientists have known for many years that one of the ways to sort of recapitulate that radical shift in your environment is to do something called deprivation. So the, people have opened the critical period for songbird learning with auditory deprivation. They've used visual deprivation to reopen the ocular dominance critical period. And we have evidence that social deprivation opens the critical period for social reward learning. And so I'm gonna end with this idea that these deprivation techniques for reopening critical periods is exactly what many of the mystical religions have been using as a sort of life hack to reopen critical periods without psychedelics, right? So you hear about these mystical religions where they go and they have, um, they live in a cave for a couple of days or they um, go into a hermitage or a monastery and live by themselves, the whirling dervishes, you know, spin around and they, they induce what the Zen Buddhists call um, a state called beginner's mind. If you were looking for a neurobiological term to describe beginner's mind, it would be reopening critical periods. So I just want to leave you with the idea that maybe what it feels like 
to reopen critical periods is just what we're talking about when we're saying that they, the, all of these practices induce the altered state of consciousness. And so with that, I'll just thank everybody who worked on this project. I especially need to take, thank Roman Nardu, who was really the lead. Thank you very much, Dr. Dolan. I'm a big fan of those slides the critical window uh, correlating with the how long the drug stays in the system, or at least the experience sticks around. I think you're on to something. Okay, the last person in this panel is uh, Dr. Cody Wenther, who is Assistant Professor, University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Pharmacy. Welcome, Dr. Wenther. Thank you so much, and uh, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, thank you to the other speakers in the panel uh, for being so brilliant, but no, thank you for saying things that um, I can only reiterate, really. Uh, no, that's not true. I think I'll have something to add here, but uh, it's better when a panel is a little contentious. But I think that we will see some of the same themes we're talking about, and those talks come up again today. Um, I gave the title of my talk to be uh, how this topic is addressed in 4D. I, I wanted to get James Cameron to produce the talk. I couldn't afford him, so if any of you guys have a hookup, that'd be great. Um, but unfortunately, there'll be no avatar-like uh, cinematic expertise here. These are the four Ds that I was thinking about when tasked with ask, answering the question, how can psychedelics be transdiagnostically effective? And the first is definition, second is disease, third is drug, fourth is design. If we start with definition, Dr. Sasa, I think, correctly pointed out that we do a bad job of defining psychiatric illnesses. And trauma-based uh, models are one way to think about this. Uh, another way to think about this is that we may have multiple people with subphenotypes being clustered within a given symptom. If you think about the way that the DSM-5 works, we have a grab bag of symptoms, right, that we're pulling from, and we say, oh yeah, you check this box, you check that box, you check the third box, boom, you have a diagnosis, right? Some of these boxes overlap between MDD, mild depression, bipolar depression, even with broader ranging psychiatric disorders. And so the question becomes harder to disentangle if you have lots of people with disparate life experiences maybe different levels of trauma, different symptomatic clusters, and you're putting them all in one category. And one way that we might be able to disentangle this is to understand that we can have more data-driven categories within each disorder. So rather than asking the question, how do psychotherapies work across diagnoses, I think we need to address the question, are they actually going to work for everyone? Because if we imagine a future where psychedelics are being applied across all these diagnoses, should we actually buy into the hype or the narrative or put out the expectation that they're going to work for everyone within those diagnoses? I would say more likely no, but that there are people across diagnoses who are going to be benefited by this, and it's our job as neuroscientists uh, to figure out who those people are, how to identify them, and then our job as clinicians to find the people across those diagnostic categories and clusters and figure out how to help them. So that's the definition piece. One other note I want to make on that is, although American psychiatrists maybe are giving the world a bad rap, hopefully American neuroscientists are uh, helping, um, the NIH has been putting together something called the RDOC, the Research Domain Criteria Initiative, to go after this exact idea, to try and say symptomatic clustering is not the end-all, be-all. We have a big disconnect between neuroscience and psychiatry, and the things we're finding out in the lab are not always translating to the clinic, and part of the way that we can do this is by breaking down these disorders into different symptomatic clusters. The second D is disease. And we talked about critical periods. We talked about trauma. And if you think about 
both of those things. In certain circumstances, stress is going to be a piece of this, certainly with trauma. With early learning critical periods, not so much, but we can also see enhanced learning, adaptation to the environment under periods of enhanced stress. And we normally think of stress as an inherently negative thing, at least colloquially, right? But biologically, stress can be extremely adaptive. If you're a mouse and a wolf is coming to eat you and your family, it's really helpful to learn what a, what a wolf smells like, how it behaves, so you can avoid being eaten by the wolf next time. And there are circuitry elements within the human brain, within the mammalian brain, that have adapted to respond to stressful stimuli and also have been proposed to be at the host of at least uh, several of the most prominent psychiatric disorders. This stands closely in line with the idea that trauma is a uh, trigger for many of what we're currently calling psychiatric disorders. And the key regions in this brain, in this brain circuit, are the hippocampus, the prefrontal cortex, and the amygdala. And we see disruption in the hippocampal to prefrontal pathway in disorders like PTSD, in disorders like depression, in disorders like schizophrenia. And this circuit modifies emotional learning and cognitive processing. Can you think about how psychedelics might interplay with those two systems to modify behavior? And can you think about how stress might play into that when thinking about having a completely altered state of consciousness? The third D is drug. And here we're looking at pharmacologically induced stressor. So psychedelics can do a lot of things dose dependently, reproducibly, including change your consciousness. But they can also reproducibly induce biological correlates of stress, things like raising cortisol. And so when you put this addition of an acute spike of cortisol on top of a profoundly different experience that's different from everyday life, and you have neural plasticity that's opening up a critical period for learning, now you potentially have a way to modify behavior and think about disease not just in the context of the trauma that's gone before and how the learning you did then will modify your behavior, but provide you with a period where what you're going to learn now is gonna modify your behavior in the future. And what you can see on the graph that I have here is from a study that we're doing uh, in rodents, where what we did was looked at an anxiety-like behavior, so put the mice in an open field, and the mice normally don't like to be in the center of that field. There might be a wolf there, for example. And if the mice spend more time in the center of that field, they have perhaps a reduced anxiety-like behavior. And in conjunction with this, we measured the amount of corticosterone, which is the mouse analog of cortisol in the blood. And what you can see in the white bars are mice on the far left that we just treated with saline. In the blue bar, mice that we treated with psilocybin. So they spend less time, they spend more time in the center, maybe reduced anxiety, and they also had this acute corticosterone spike. Now on the right, what you can see is if we treated these animals previously, with corticosterone in their water so that you couldn't get an acute spike of cort, but you instead had persistently elevated cort corticosterone, that the behavior is reversed. The psilocybin is now actually reducing their time in the center and increasing anxiety. So I think the question of resolving stress is a really important one, not just in mice, but in patients as well. So if we have patients who are getting psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, they have a very challenging experience. They go through and have resolution due to their excellent psychotherapy. That's one thing. If we have someone who has an acute stressful period, but it's not resolved because they're still housing unstable, because they're still in a systemically racist society, because they, don't, they can't eat, it's probably not gonna work, not just from the common sense reasons that we can think of, but also might have biological underpinnings that we can see here. The last D is design. Uh, 
psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. The drug is the adjunct. Psychotherapy and placebo are also effective across psychiatric diagnoses. We're putting these drugs in our studies inside a psychotherapeutic container. That's transdiagnostic, so we shouldn't be surprised that adding psychedelics on top of that is also transdiagnostic. And placebo is a hell of a drug. It works really well across a lot of settings, and if we're putting enhanced expectation and special settings on top of this drug, we're also likely to have a transdiagnostic intervention. Thank you very much. Thank you, three panelists. I just want to add a quick uh, thing. One of the, when I talk about transdiagnosticity, I usually focus on cognitive rigidity versus cognitive flexibility. A lot of the diagnoses, if you think about, uh, for instance, OCD, you're convinced that uh, you need to worry about germs, which turns out to be true. Uh, or in uh, addiction, you're convinced that whatever substance you're going for is going to make you feel better. Or with anxiety, you're convinced that the world's a dangerous place. You've got this rigidity of thinking. Uh, and the psychedelic assisted therapy creates a little bit of cognitive flexibility. Like, what if that's not true? What if everything that I've been thinking isn't actually true and you're just opening, having an opened mind? Um, I keep, we keep getting these questions upvoted over and over and it's about kids. It's about working with kids. And Dr. Sessa, I would like you to answer this. Uh, we seem to be having a bit of a mental health crisis with children, uh, even predating COVID. Are there opportunities for psychedelic assisted therapies for this population? Are there specific concerns for working with children or adolescents? I'm not saying you're doing it, but what are your thoughts about doing it? Um, okay. so. One very simple way of answering that, in contemporary times there have been no protocols for psychedelic therapies in children or young people. Um, there were a few notable ones in the 60s with uh, less than e ethical um, practices, um, but in, in modern times there haven't been any protocols for children or young people. There will be, and if it's safe and efficacious, there ought to be. Um, I spent many years doing pediatrics in my training, and one of the first things you learn in pediatric prescribing is if uh, medicine is safe and efficacious in children, it's unethical not to use it. The concept of you can't give that to that person because they're a child is deeply unethical uh, towards children. Um, there are special uh, rules around pharmacology with children in terms of their size and their weight and their liver function and that kind of thing and their brain development. But if it works and it's safe, it's unethical not to. I have seen too many young people lose the battle and die in their teenage years to trauma-based disorders when they just cannot go on anymore for the same reasons as adults, in that the drugs are ineffective and don't work, and they are unable to access the psychotherapies. Now, children and young people are closer to the childhood trauma. Um, and that makes it doubly difficult to access the psychotherapies. So yes, there will be um, uh, protocols for using psychedelics in children who can carry out talk therapy, and MAPS will be doing that with their MDMA program. Good answer. Thank you. It's good to know. <clears throat> this is a question for Dr. Dolan. How exactly do you measure when a critical period is in an open state and when it closes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so we're we're measuring this in mice, and so, you know, in animal studies in general, they're usually behavioral protocols, so in our particular critical period, we're measuring um, the amount of time they spend in two novel arenas, um, and then beforehand, so we measure sort of a baseline, and then we come back, and after we've conditioned them to the two novel beddings, one in a social condition, one in an isolate condition, we measure how much time they spend in each of those. And basically, the answer is, is that when they're juveniles, they learn that association really well um, and really uh, robustly, and it's a positive association because mice are social animals. Um, and as the animals mature, they don't really learn that association anymore. And so the way that we think about this in relating to human behavior is, is you know, this is kind of why teenagers care so much more about um, you know, what exact shade of acid wash jeans is cool. Um, but when you get older, you stop caring so much about that and why you wear, you know, ugly shoes because they're comfortable. Um, and, uh, you know, and so, um, but it's, it has other repercussions, right? It's also about 
about you know why teenagers are more susceptible to peer pressure, why it is that when we travel to other countries where their uh, culture is different, we sometimes feel uncomfortable in that culture because we don't we didn't learn the social rules according to that culture. We learned them for our culture. So. And do you think it's possible to use psychedelics to open a critical period for language learning? <laughs> that, that would be my dream. My sister doesn't seem to have a critical period for language learning. She speaks like seven languages and it's so annoying. <laughs> she goes to a country and within a couple of weeks starts speaking the language. So yeah, that would be my dream. I and would this love is to without psychedelics, I'm assuming? She, yeah, without psychedelics, she just never closed them. I don't know why.